be done. Amen. You can have a seat. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> I've explained this before a little bit, but one of the things that I did during my sabbatical time is uh, I spent a lot of time researching my family heritage. Uh, and and um, the reason that I did that was purely self-motivation. It was for scholarship purposes for my daughter as she's getting ready to go to college. Uh, but I've always known growing up, I mean, we always knew that we have this direct line through my mom's family uh, back to the Mayflower and even beyond that. And I wanted to know a little bit more of that, of what's beyond that, what, what was going on that got uh, some of my... Uh, uh, my relatives uh, onto that boat in the first place, and because not only have I have I discovered just really cool things that are in there, there's a lot of names in there that are recognizable that I'm proud of. One of them is a guy by the name of Darius Alden. He was the very first Tom Thumb in the Ringling Brothers Circus. Hey, you know, right? People are like that explains it. Uh, but um, but but one of the things too, just for me, right? As I as I embrace kind of my my family heritage is is I want to I want to live into that, right? I want to even they're not around, they don't they're not watching over me, but I want to make the family name proud. And and I know for a fact, reading the Mayflower Compact, of why these individuals got on this boat and came to this new land in the first place is so they could proclaim the name of Jesus in in freedom without any overreach over them. And I feel like that's part of my calling in my life as well, right? That is my calling. And all of us, we want to proclaim the name of Jesus and the freedom that he has to offer. Family matters. Family is vital. Um, there's a, a family in the late 1800s. They're known as the Jukes. They were studied by researchers and scientists uh, because of, of uh, how, really, in reality, how horrible they were as a family, these five sisters that were obviously born to their parents um, have 1,200 descendants that had come out of, uh, out of those five women. 400 of them were considered to be physically self-wrecked. In other words, they, they ruined their own lives with drunkenness uh, and all that comes along with it. 310 of those descendants became professional beggars. In other words, they just kind of took advantage of other people. 130 of them were convicted criminals, but 500 of them were criminals. 60 habitual thieves and pickpockets, seven murderers. Out of the entire 1,200 descendants, 20 ever learned a trade. And 10 of them, 10 of those 20, learned that trade while they were in prison. Right, right. So, so there was this study done on the Jukes family to say, okay, there's something to this. There's so many uh, lines that have come down to generations out of this family that seem to be, it just doesn't seem to be getting better in the eyes of what we would consider, consider moral society. And, and that actually, they were like the study that actually fueled um, eugenics, which was a horrible horrible uh, scientific uh, study that was done and, and a belief that, that, if you, that really what we should do is to start sterilizing those that, that, that are troublemakers and then it even went into those that, that were physically disabled so that we could eventually have a, a country that would just be uh, people that were good and pure. Uh, however, there was uh, a guy by the name of Hitler that grabbed a hold of eugenics and, and really kind of made this thing popular to where everybody said, okay, this is awful, <laughs> right? Which we know that it is. Uh, is. We know, we read Scripture, is who we are because ultimately deep within our souls because of the family that we grew up in? Uh, or, or, or is it something greater? There's another family in the middle of the 1800s, the Scudders, that were... Uh, missionaries. John Scudder and his wife were missionaries to India, and uh, of their ten children that they had, um, nine of them went into full-time missions uh, back to India. Uh, the one that didn't, uh, because she passed away while in training to become a missionary to go to uh, India. Um, five of their grandchildren became medical missionaries, and in a hundred years, uh, the hundred-year celebration of 
uh, their ministry to India, three of their great-grandchildren felt the call to ministry and set sail for India, and 31 now descendants have become missionaries in India, while many, many more are serving around the world. Family is vital. We know from uh, the story of the Jukes family, right, that, that they're just living out what they've seen in their lives. What's the examples that have been set for them? And the same thing goes for uh, the Scudder family. They, they've taken their name and they've embraced it, some of them for the bad, some of them for the good. Well, this is just who we are. One of the things that I did uh, in in digging deeper into my family line is I had to contact, call, email a lot of vital records departments of a lot of states around the United States to get birth certificates and marriage licenses from the 1800s to to try to get up with to prove that I am who I am Uh, because family is vital. It matters. And that's what we're going to take a look at today as we wrap up Matthew chapter 12. While you're turning there, Uh, To the end of Matthew 12, starting in verse 46, uh, just to refresh everybody, we've been, we spent a lot of time the last number of weeks looking at the interaction that Jesus has with the the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, who were constantly telling him what he was doing was wrong. They were constantly attacking his disciples, basically trying to tell them you shouldn't follow Jesus because he's not a good teacher for you. Uh, We found the Pharisees lying about who he was, proclaiming and saying that his power that he has comes from the devil, and Jesus has uh, rebutted that and proved who he was. And in today's text, it's going to kind of wrap up chapter 12 in this conversation um, by Jesus once again proclaiming who he is. However, he now gets to shift the focus and in all of it to look at the crowd that has stuck with him to say, Let me tell you your identity. Let me tell you about what family you are now a part of. So this is what it says, Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 46. If you can, if you're able, if you're willing, let's stand together as I read this to us. Uh, While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking that they could speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Let's pray. Father, uh, in the next few moments that we have together, would you just do a work? You've given us your word. What you want us to know, help us to understand. So may your spirit Uh, Just be at work within our hearts, our ears, our minds. Let us be focused on you, God. I pray that you'll be with me as well. God, protect my words that I don't say what you don't want me to say, that I say what you do so that we could continue this mission that you are on uh, and join you in it. In your name, amen. You could have a seat. So let's talk about this important moment that that Jesus has, vital moment that Jesus has in this uh, situation. Matthew chapter 13, which we'll get to, uh, which by the way, next week, Paul Ewing is going to be here. He's our field director, missionary from Japan. So we're excited. He's also a son of Century Baptist Church. So he grew up in the youth group. His dad was pastor here. His dad was my pastor growing up. And uh, Paul and his family now serve in Japan. And he's going to come back next week and actually bring us the word, uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. I figure who better to talk about the, the sharing of the gospel than a missionary, to talk about the scattering of the seed. But uh, for the next 20 minutes, you got me. So um, we'll keep moving right along. So um, Matthew 13 will tell us a little more about Jesus' family, that he's got sisters, that he obviously has a mom and a dad, and that he has brothers. And thir- chapter 13 actually names his brothers, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And, and what we need to understand then going into... Uh, this text is like always. I can't stress it enough. We talk about it all the time. You've got to look at, whenever you read scripture, you've got to look at context. What's happening around the passage that I'm reading, but also what's happening in the entirety of scripture, because scripture will never contradict scripture. And if you ever think that it does, it means that you've got to do a little more study. 
right? That you, we got to dig a little deeper because because it will never go against it. So there must be a deeper meaning, and so there's deep meaning in our text today. Um, the first four books of the New Testament. If you're not familiar necessarily with Scripture. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are the Gospels. They're the good news. They're telling about who Jesus is, but each of them is telling it from a different perspective as a follower of Jesus. And the, the way in which they're able to tell it with such detail is that they lived it, they learned it from each other, and as we believe because we hold high and apply the Word of God is that it was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit given to man to write down. So this is God's word that he's given to us of what we're supposed to know about him, about Jesus, about ourselves. And so in these gospels, they all are telling this story of this interaction between Jesus and his family and these messengers and the people that are listening all from a different uh, perspective. And so what we have to understand is that, so Jesus hears, hey, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are outside. And it seems as though Jesus is being really disrespectful to mom. Right? How many of you as moms, you know, your son all of a sudden gets some fame and fortune and you're out at the back of the crowd like, hey, could you, could you, I, I just need to talk to my, my son. And, and they come back like, yeah, your son says he doesn't even know you. Right? I mean, who's my mother? Right? And I'm like, ouch. Well, there's not disrespect here. That, that's not what's taking place. Let me take you back to, to over to the book of Mark chapter 3, which parallels Matthew chapter 12. It's Mark's telling of this and it's almost word for word, but it gives us a little bit more insight about what's going on. Mark chapter 3 is a lot like Matthew chapter 12. It talks about Jesus healing the man with the withered hand and Jesus healing the sick and the growth of the followers that he has. Um, And then uh, Mark tells of Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees and them accusing him of being really possessed by the devil and doing work under the power of the devil and Jesus uh, convincing them or trying to convince them that he's not. But then Mark, end, Mark 3 ends with really this same narrative of uh, his family coming and they want to talk to him and, um, and, and Jesus doesn't acknowledge it. And the reason that he does, Mark actually tells us why. Um, verse 21 of Mark chapter 3 says, When, when Jesus' family heard, uh, heard it, that is that the crowds were following him, that he was healing people, that he was calling disciples, it says that they went out to seize him. So they didn't just come to talk to him. They actually came to get him. Why? Because it says, because they were saying he's out of his mind. Jesus' own family didn't believe in who he was. I'm sure they loved him. It's the oldest brother, right? He's the firstborn. Mary, Mary knew who Jesus was. I mean, how do, you, how do you forget when an angel visits you and says, hey, you're pregnant, ta-da, you know, and you're going to have a baby and he's going to be the savior of the world. You don't forget that. And I'm, I got to imagine, I can only imagine, it doesn't tell us in scripture, but I have to imagine how many times Mary and Joseph sat down with their kids to tell the story about why their brother was, a, was different. Right? But, but now they're hearing, because what's happening? Uh, they're hearing that everybody's saying that Jesus is crazy that Jesus is demon-possessed, that there's this guy that's walking around and he's claiming to be the Messiah. And I'm sure, the because I'm a, I'm a brother, right? And, and when people, if people would say, your sister's crazy, I, would go, I know, but no, I, I wouldn't. I, I, would say, I, I, would say, I would say, hey man, that's my sister, right? Don't talk about her that way. And, and all these people are talking about Jesus and they're going, hey, let's go get him. Mom, can we just go get Jesus? He's causing all of these problems. He's embarrassing us. People are talking bad about him, and I'm getting made fun of at school because, you know, of what, I don't know, I don't know what happened, but they need, it says that they go to, to seize him. They, they didn't want to just come and talk to him. They want to get him out of there because he's causing too many problems, and, and they just really are in it either for themselves or to try to save uh, Jesus. And Jesus will say in chapter 13, he knows it. Right? That's, that's why Jesus' response was the way that it was. Who are my mother and brothers? It was, he, he said, I'm going to use this as a teaching opportunity uh, because I know why they're here. And he goes to Nazareth, his hometown, in, in Matthew chapter 13, and it, it says that a prophet is never welcome in his hometown or in his own home. He knows it. His family doesn't accept him for who he is. John chapter 7 
Jesus uh, stayed in Galilee when everybody else was going up to Jerusalem for one of the major Jewish feasts. And Jesus stays. And his brothers come to him and like, hey man, what are you doing down here? You should go to Jerusalem. Because uh, if you really want to be as popular as it seems, you should go there because that's where the crowd's going to be. And you can kind of do your thing up there. And everybody will follow after you, right? So they were, it was kind of this mocking of him. Jesus knows that they didn't believe in him. And that's what John 7, 5 says. Not even his brothers believed in him. That's why they're there. All right, so, so it, it paints a different picture. Uh, rather than, hey, we want to come, Jesus, and we, we want to we wanna get to the inner circle and we want to learn from you. No, no, no. They, they, were, they were trying to distract from the work of God. We're just trying to get you uh, out of here. Matthew says they want to speak with him, but we know why. They were cynics in the fullest sense of the word. It just it, it means to believe that somebody else is motivated by their own self-interest. It's to doubt someone's motivation. And I want to be really careful today because I don't, I don't want to, uh, well, I don't care if people get angry. I don't want to be angry about this. But you hear me talk about this all the time. I'm, I'm exhausted by Christian cynics in the world today. Uh, it's actually breaking my heart. And as a person in ministry, uh, somebody asked me, what would ever cause you uh, to ever want to quit doing ministry? And, and, and I said, uh, it'll, be, it'll be the cynics in Christianity because they're wearing me down. And they're wearing other... I hear it from young people all the time. Why are Christians so angry when they're... Supposed to be about the joy of the Lord. Remember, remember a couple weeks ago, uh, the Grammys uh, on Sunday night, and we saw some pretty vile displays that took place. And the response, I believe, was a good response from from a lot of Christians. Like we need to call our country back to prayer because our young people are losing their focus, and it seems like the enemy's got a grip. And so I believe that people prayed. And you know what happened? Two days later, at a small little college in Kentucky, a revival broke out, something fierce, that hasn't stopped even to today. Praise and worship, thousands of young people have turned their lives over to Christ. In a day and an age when when I've been crying out to God for this generation, because 60% of ages, uh, between the ages of 10 and 20, have considered suicide. 45% of Generation Z are struggling with depression and anxiety. And we we just need to, there's just been this cry, God, we need you to do something. And he's doing something in that age group. Then I got to go online this past week and over and over and over again, I got to hear from Christians that say, well, be careful that you call that a revival. I heard one guy say, because they're not using the version of the Bible that I use, so it can't be of the Holy Spirit. Be careful, be careful that you call that revival because the songs that they're singing really aren't the songs that we would choose to sing in our church. One guy said, I was there for an hour and it can't be revival, it's not the Holy Spirit because I was there for an hour and nobody preached. It's been going on for 10 days. You were there for an hour? That's like somebody coming here and sitting in worship and they walk out after the first minute and go, well, uh, nobody prayed, nobody preached. That what a terrible place that is. It's not our job to judge. we got to stop being cynics and, and just praise God that he's answering the prayers that we asked him to. God, would you send a revival because our country seems like it's just going down the tubes. And then he does, and we're like, oh, God, but would you send it differently? Not like that. That can't be you. Why don't we just, why don't we just shut up, right, and lift up our hands And just praise God and say, God, thanks for what you're doing in this world. I don't want to be known. I don't want to be known as the cynic. I I talk with people and they got a testimony to share. Like, oh, God's doing this. I go, why don't you tell somebody? Like, I don't have anybody to tell because everybody that I want to sit and talk to will tell me about why it's wrong. Because that's the world that we live in. We don't talk about the wins that God is up to because we know that there's always going to be this one voice over here about telling us, about why there's something that's wrong with it. So let's just let God work. People ask me, what do you think about the revival in Asbury? I'm like, good. If God's doing a work there, then let him do the work, and then let it come and start in my heart. I would love to see it happen, but it's got to start with me. It's got to start with you. And then let's watch what God does, because that's exactly what God does. 
Jesus doesn't care about the cynics and they're his own family. He's like, I know what's behind your heart. I'm not even going to respond to it. But thanks for, thanks for, thanks for coming because I'm going to use this to encourage the people that are here right in front of me. And so his response is significant. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? And he extends his hand and he points to the crowd that has stuck with him. This crowd that's been with him as, as the Pharisees have tried over and over and over again to discredit him, right? Oh, he lets you work on the Sabbath. Oh, he heals on the Sabbath. Oh, he's possessed by the devil. And they're just going on and on and on. And Jesus stops and says, you want to know who my family is? They're the ones that stuck with me through all of your garbage. They're the ones that are still here, that are following me through it all, that have given up everything in order to follow after me. This is my mother and brothers. Anybody who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, my mother. He's not disowning his family at all. He's not disrespecting them at all. He's using it for this teachable moment to speak into the identity of people who, if they follow after him, are going to have to walk away from their own families, a lot of them. Jesus told them that. A lot of you are going to lose your family because of me. And so he says, but, but I'm your family and the people around you are also yours. The will of God, Jesus says. It's referred to over and over again. Matthew, when he talks about the will of God, is always about obedience to God through Jesus Christ. Or we could just sum it up in chapter 7, where Jesus said the only ones that will see the kingdom of God are those that do the will of God. And that implied meaning of doing the will of God is an eternal work. In other words, that can only be done by Christ, by following after him. John 6, 28, the disciples asked Jesus, what is it that God wants from me? What does he want me to do? And, and Jesus says that God's will is to believe in the one that he's sent. That's his will. His will for each and every person, for each and every one of us here. He desires that none should ever perish. The will of God, a blueprint for life, is that you follow Christ. So in this culture that, that Jesus was in, that people were just brought up to, you never left your family. You rarely ever went uh, further than probably 10, 20 miles from your home because you just stayed with your family and you, that, the home just continued to grow. You'd get married, you'd build an addition onto your dad's house and you'd just move your bride in and you'd have kids and you just keep expanding the, kind of the family compound. Every decision that you made, we, we make a lot of decisions, is this the best for me, right? In ancient Jewish cultures, is this the best for my family and is it the best for my neighbors? Is this the best for my town, my tribe, my clan, my city? You, you cared about community. So to follow after Jesus, uh, what was, who was considered to be, even by his own family, but the religious leaders of the day, kind of an, an outcast and, and, and one who is a little bit crazy, to follow him would be really an abandonment of faith and your family then would say, we can't have anything to do with you. And so Jesus says, so I have to show you that, that, that if you follow me, um, I'm your family. You're my family. We're family together. That's why, the, that's why the New Testament throughout talks about the church as the body of Christ. It's a whole new identity that he's giving to these people who are looking for identity. So many of Jesus' followers early on were the outcasts, the lepers, and the sick, and, and, and the, the blind, the man with the withered hand who, who couldn't work on his own, they were already cast out by their family. And Jesus comes along and he says, I'm going to give you a whole new name. I'm going to give you a whole new meaning and a whole new purpose. I'm going to give you hope. And I'm going to be with you uh, every step of the way. You are my family. Galatians 3.26 says that in Christ Jesus you become the sons of God through faith, no longer labeled by Jew or Greek or male or female or slave or free. If you are Christ, he says you are all Abraham's offspring. Imagine that. Imagine being a, a Gentile who's been told your whole life by the Jews that they're special and they're receiving God's promise on their life and God wants to do great things in their life and God blesses them, but you'll never get it because you're, you're not one of them. And Paul comes along and says, if you believe in Christ, if you allow him to be king and rule over your life, you inherit the promise as well. There's a great future for you. You all become sons of God, children of the living God. 
Do you know what that would do in the hearts of people who always felt like they were nobodies? Maybe you do. Because maybe, maybe you've come from a family that you would say, well, we're not the Jukes, but we're pretty close, right? And, and, and people don't think very highly of us or our family because of what our parents or grandparents or my siblings or even what I did. Maybe your identity is in your negative activity and action, and you just say, is there a place for me? Scripture is full of it. Jesus says it. Yeah, you can be a part of my family. I'll give my life up. I, I would die to have you as a part of my family, for you to take my name, for you to, to then inherit my traits, right? To start living into this community that I have continued to build. So there's a decision, key decision that comes out of, out of this text for us today. Plain and simple, are you part of the family of God? Uh, are you one who uh, has made the decision to say, you know what, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, uh, whatever the cost is. Have you embraced God's will for you, his desire for you, that you would believe in Christ and that you would be saved into his family? Do you believe in the power of the gospel, this activity of Christ giving his life up for you? going to the cross, dying for your sins, and you just say, I recognize it. I recognize that I am the sinner that you needed to die for. And, and, and I, I want a new life. I want the new name. Jesus says, so give it to me. Surrender. Acknowledge who I am. Galatians 2.20 uh, tells us that when we allow ourselves to be crucified with Christ, in other words, we acknowledge what he did on the cross and say, yeah, I want to die to myself too. No longer the selfishness, but but Jesus, I want you to rule within me. That that's exactly what happens. That it's no longer I who live, but now it's Christ who lives in me. His power at work. Our identity now is changed. It's no longer about who we were or what we did. It's now about who's Jesus, what's he up to, and how am I going to let him work through me. And today, if you say, I know all that, I, I believe that I am, a disciple of Jesus. I am a follower of him. I love him. Let me just challenge you uh, with, a, with a really quick, just, it's just a great once in a while to, to just do a quick heart check for ourselves. Jesus says in Luke 14, as he elevates the seriousness of what it means to be a disciple, he says, if anybody does not hate his own father and mother and wife and child and brothers and sisters or even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let me, again, let me go back to Jesus what Jesus means by this. Because if we go back to when he's giving an explanation of kind of the Old Testament and, and the Ten Commandments, remember he said if you, if you hate your brother, it's just the same as, as killing them. So Jesus obviously isn't telling us that in order to follow him, we got to hate everybody else. That's just foolishness. That's not, that's not the gospel. So you have to look at that word. That word is miso in the original Greek, and it's got multiple meanings. One of them is hatred because that's how we understand it in English, but really what it, it also means, it means to love a lot less. And that's what Jesus is saying. That, that the only way that you can follow me is you've got to love everything else a lot less. So today we have to take an inventory of our lives and we just have to say, so, so yes, I, I claim that Jesus is king, but who's on, actually on the throne? And there can be some really great things that we actually can fool ourselves into things that are very God-honoring, that, 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 that are actually things that we love, that we think that are good, because I know that there are a lot that, that we put our children on that throne. We need to love our children greatly, but less than we love Jesus. We need to love our spouse, that we would be willing to die for them sacrificially, but we need to love our spouse less than we love Jesus. We need to love our neighbors. We're told that. But we need to love them less than we love Jesus. We need to love our stuff less than we love Jesus, our jobs, our careers, our titles, all of that. And the way that we do it is you just choose to love Jesus. And you put him in the perspective of him on the throne, and it's going to give you a much better view of everything else. And let me tell you, you are going to love your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your coworkers, your neighbors, your enemies, so much better if you love Jesus best. 
It's vital to our lives. He wants to give us a new identity. He wants us to embrace it. Jesus says in Luke 14, if you don't renounce everything, you can't be my disciple. He doesn't mean disconnect from it. He says, are you willing to give me full allegiance? And then I'll do a great thing through you to do a great thing for those that you love. Do you love Jesus? Make him king. Let's pray. Jesus, today we say thank you for your word. God, thank you for how you've given it to us so that we have instruction on how to live life the way that you want us to. Jesus, thanks for setting the example. We come to you today, Father, and we say we're sorry. Forgive us for continuing to create this culture in the church today where we want to doubt everything first. Jesus, Help us to love you more than anything else, more than ourselves, so that when we do see you in action, we know it's you. So that we can be prepared that on that day, when the trumpets sound and the clouds part and Jesus, you return for us, that we don't have uh, any inkling of doubt in our minds that it's you.